Chapter 4 My dear Wormwood, The amateur suggestions in your last letter warn me that it is high time for me to write to you fully on the painful subject of prayer. You might have spared the comment that my advice about his prayers for his mother proved singularly unfortunate. That is not the sort of thing that a nephew should write to his uncle, nor a junior tempter to the undersecretary of a department. It also reveals an unpleasant desire to shift responsibility. You must learn to pay for your own blunders. The best thing, where it is possible, is to keep the patient from the serious intention of praying altogether. When the patient is an adult, recently reconverted to the enemy's party, like your man, this is best done by encouraging him to remember, or think he remembers, the parrot-like nature of his prayers in childhood. In reaction against that, he may be persuaded to aim at something entirely spontaneous, inward, informal, and unregularized, and what this will actually mean to a beginner will be an effort to produce in himself a vaguely devotional mood, in which real concentration of will and intelligence have no part. One of their poets, Coleridge, has recorded that he did not pray with moving lips and bended knees, but merely composed his spirit to love and indulged a sense of supplication. <laughs> this is exactly the sort of prayer we want, since it bears a superficial resemblance to the prayers of silence, as practiced by those who are very far advanced in the enemy's service, Clever and lazy patients can be taken in by it for quite a long time. At the very least, they can be persuaded that the bodily position makes no difference to their prayers, for they constantly forget what you must always remember, that they are animals, and that whatever their bodies do affects their souls. It is funny how mortals always picture us putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. If this fails, you must fall back on a subtler misdirection of his intention. Whenever they are attending to the enemy himself, we are defeated. But there are ways of preventing them from doing so. The simplest is to turn their gaze away from him and toward themselves. Keep them watching their own minds and trying to produce feelings there by the actions of their own wills. When they meant to ask him for charity, let them, instead, start trying to manufacture charitable feelings for themselves and not notice that this is what they are doing. When they meant to pray for courage, let them really be trying to feel brave. When they say they are praying for forgiveness, let them try to feel forgiven. Teach them to estimate the value of each prayer by their success in producing the desired feeling, and never let them suspect how much success or failure of that kind depends on whether they are well or ill, fresh or tired at that moment. But, of course, the enemy will not meantime be idle. Whenever there is prayer, there is danger of his own immediate action. He is cynically indifferent to the dignity of his position, and ours, as pure spirits, and to human animals on their knees, he pours out self-knowledge in a quite shameless fashion. But even if he defeats your first attempt at misdirection, we have a subtler weapon. Humans do not start from that direct perception of him which we, unhappily, cannot avoid— they have never known that ghastly luminosity, that stabbing and searing glare which makes the background of permanent pain in our lives. If you look into your patient's mind when he is praying, you will not find that. If you examine the object to which he is attending, you will find that it is a composite object containing many quite ridiculous ingredients. There will be images derived from pictures of the enemy as he appeared during the discreditable episode known as the Incarnation. There will be the vaguer, perhaps quite savage and puerile, images associated with the other two persons. 
There will even be some of his own reverence and of bodily sensations accompanying it, objectified and attributed to the object revered. I have known cases where the patient called his God was actually located up and to the left at the corner of the bedroom ceiling, or inside his own head, or in a crucifix on the wall. But whatever the nature of the composite object, you must keep him praying to it, to the thing that he has made, not to the person who has made him. You may even encourage him to attach great importance to the correction and improvement of his composite object, and to keeping it steadily before his imagination during the whole prayer. For if he ever comes to make the distinction, if he consciously directs his prayers, not to what I think thou art, but what thou knowest thyself to be, our situation is, for the moment, desperate. Once all his thoughts and images have been flung aside, or, if retained, retained with a full recognition of their merely subjective nature, and the man trusts himself to the completely real, external, invisible presence, there with him in the room, and never knowable by him, as he is known by it, why, then it is that the incalculable may occur. In avoiding this situation, this real nakedness of the soul in prayer, you will be helped by the fact that the humans themselves do not desire it as much as they suppose. There's such a thing as getting more than they bargained for. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.